All right, I'm gonna start just uh, 30 seconds early, just so I have tons of content. I wanna make sure I cover, cover all of it. Um, first of all, welcome. I'm glad you're here. I believe this could be pretty close to the last session, so that's nice, a lot of, a lot of fun there. I'll start with who I am. Um, my name is Jerry, hello. That's great, yep, I feel the same way. And uh, I work at Microsoft, so we can get that out of the way. Um, I'm on the SQL Server team. I work specifically with developer experiences, so all of the developer tooling and all the special features that come just for developers, um, those are my team, and so it's a lot of fun. And we'll cover a lot of those little pieces along the way so that you can kind of see what your options are in the concept of workflow for all data engineering. And so this, this session is just tons of information about random things. And so the fact that you're here is amazing. I, I really struggled to even name it. There were so many things I wanted to cover. Um, that being said, I was in field engineering for Microsoft for before I came to, to SQL two years ago. And um, a lot of this talk is really about that experience. Uh, really, it's about the things that I got to do with some of the larger customers that Microsoft has. And that is going to be lessons learned that you guys can take. And I'll say this probably a dozen times in this talk, but you'll find that just nibbling at some of the things that they have done allows you to put together a really reasonable um, data strategy for your own company. And it doesn't make sense to look at the largest companies and see how they do things and then just model immediately after them because they do crazy things. And just because they're doing it, I can promise you, it is not always based on the best technical reasoning. Sometimes it's based off of politics. Sometimes it's based off the fact that they're going to be acquired in two years. Sometimes it's based off the fact they need to report a certain thing to the stock market. There's always things that drive technical decisions. And that's gonna be true with your company as well. So just kind of hold that in your pocket and be comfortable with it because it's okay that you don't necessarily match the cover of the magazine. And that's really a valuable kind of place to be. And it's a difficult thing to speak to your manager about, right? Because you're like, oh, this is totally different than the rest of the industry. Yeah, but this is what really makes sense for us. And so it's nice, hopefully, we'll be able to talk through some of the things that will be uh, those arguments and those kind of considerations. Now the picture matters for me because this tells you who I really am. I'm a big time Star Trek fan. All the way around, my analogies are with Star Trek. Everything is Star Trek. My children, we all went to Comic-Con last year. All of us were an away team in uniform. It was fabulous. Everything was great about it. And so anyway, this if there's, I like being the nerd side of things. Uh, people are like, what are your hobbies outside of work? And it's like software development. And so it's weird to say that sort of thing, but I also love Star Trek, so there you go. And I like coming this side of the Atlantic because Star Trek is far more popular outside of the United States than inside of the United States, which is a fascinating thing, depending on your little po pocket where you happen to be. Okay, but that's not what we're gonna talk about today. Chapter one, data sources. The way that you would come across, let's just pretend, you're like me and you're a consultant that goes into a customer and you're there to do a lot of different things. Usually the consultant is there to break a tie. Somebody inside the company is thinking about one thing or another and you're there to say what it's supposed to be, things they know or are too afraid to say so they'll let you say it to take the blame if it fails. But that's what they wanted to do all along so they're willing to pay whatever crazy hourly amount they're gonna pay you. Perfect, that's great. So this is what you'll see most of the time. All the way back to the uh, Olympic Games in 2022 in Tokyo, if you've forgotten. Um, it's funny, the Olympics have totally taken on a new kind of thing, haven't they? But regardless, here we have the order of the medals based on the position on the podium. That's why they're like that, right? So gold is in the middle and then silver and bronze. But this is the medallion strategy that you'll see in almost every company going forward as they start to think about how they're gonna have their, their uh, their data, they will lay it out in this strategy. Uh, anybody see this already? You know what I'm about to say? All right, well, this is gonna be an, a moment. Okay, so they will bring their data in three different times. So the first time they'll bring it into a layer that they'll refer to as the bronze tier. Sometimes they'll refer to it as the raw data layer. And thank goodness we have uh, data lakes because data lakes have really changed the way we look at data, copying data and storing data. It used to be so expensive in order for us to have data and to keep it. Now we would try and figure out ways to make it smaller and smaller and smaller. And often normalization, the argument around normalization for data in the database is just to reduce the data footprint so we can have it smaller. 
a lot of those considerations are totally gone. I mean, now we just take everything, explode it, we normalize it, denormalize it now into like a parquet text file and just jam it into another folder. So it's amazing how things have changed. But what is the bronze layer? The bronze layer is your line of business application, your HR system, your sales system, your factory system, whatever it is, and you are taking a copy of that data and you're just dumping it into a data lake. That's the end. You don't do anything to it. There's no transformation along the way. You're literally just extracting it and loading it. Nothing else happens. And maybe you'll do it nightly. Maybe you'll do it in a batch process that makes it so that all the data comes in and goes out. Maybe you'll do it in a streaming process, which is very cool. Maybe you'll do it as some sort of like event will cause it. So you'll do a quarterly dump or even an annual dump. It's not out of, it's not out of the realm of possibility. Certainly it happens. The data that's inside your first application, which is your HR system, and the data that's in your second application, which is, let's say, like inventory or sales, is not going to match. It's not going to naturally relate to one another, but that's okay. That's not the point of the bronze layer. The bronze layer says, just give it to me. And it's this just dump truck that backs up and just pours bits everywhere. That is the bronze layer, and it is awesome. I mean, if you just think about, all of a sudden you have access to data that you would otherwise not have access to. I don't mean the government governance is gone or any regu regulatory compliance around the data. All the PII is still protected. That is the difficult part of implementing a bronze layer, first of all. But that's the reason we have things like, like lake houses or the one lake so that we can have um, like data dictionaries or purview, things like that to still maintain governance. That's not what I'm talking about. It's not a security playground. It's just an area where all the data is there and you don't have to go to the owner of that system, the one who's responsible and always nervous that you're gonna slow their system down and ask for data so that you can build a report. So in that sense, a bronze is really nice. And just getting there is quite the accomplishment for most companies. Now the next layer is the important one. So if we're at bronze, we go up to silver. So the silver metal is the silver layer. Sometimes it's referred to as the cleansed layer. So the cleansed layer then, we look at all of the data and everything is sitting there just happy, except we've also gone in and said, said all the duplicate data, we've been able to identify it and we've removed it. All of the keys that relate between different organization or different uh, applications, we've been able to find a surrogate key between the two of them so they can be joined. We've gone in and changed you know, uh, the, the way countries are represented in this data field and the way they're represented in this data field have kind of been worked together so that they can be matched now so that they, it's not just two letters but it's or whatever it is that you need to do. And so the cleansed layer is another amazing accomplishment for any enterprise. And if you think about it, that, I mean, just getting to this is the, that's the holy grail. Like we're already there. Being able to write reports, would you like to write a report against the bronze section or, or the bronze layer or the silver layer? Of course you'd want to write it against the silver because think of how little work or how much less work you'd have to do because all the work's been done for you. That's one of the reasons you see so little data in a silver layer because so much work has to be done in order to even get it there. So there's this issue of like not just data size, but also timing and cleanliness and all of those. We'll talk about those in a second. But we have a silver layer now. So we've gone from the bottom, which we'll call bronze. We've gone then up to a much better layer. And if you picture it as a triangle, you're doing the right thing. More and more data is being weaned out as we go to it. And then we go to the gold layer. This is Nirvana itself. So the gold layer is spectacular because it is the curated layer where True business experts have gone in and done real data engineering to make it so that not only the data itself is easy to use, it is well documented, it is laid out in a, in a very, very useful way. They've also pre-aggregated certain things because they know that you're gonna wanna know the quarterly report for all of our sales across different regions. So those are all pre-aggregated and ready and even faster for you to be able to get. You don't have to do certain algorithms inside your data because those have been introduced for you. That's the curated layer. And we've even brought in additional data from the outside. So if you wanted to say, are our sales up and what was the weather at the time? All of that data is there as well. So we enrich the data as well as cleanse it and make it curated and ready for the business. That's the gold layer. Excellent, by the way. Everybody wants to write reports against the gold layer. It is a miracle if you have a bronze layer. It is, it is a, you have reinvented the entire universe if you have a silver layer. The gold layer is 
less common. Let me say it that way. It's just less common. But we all are striving for it. And that's really an important kind of part to think about. All right, so what is in the way? So here we are with three line of business apps, each one on their way to the gold layer. Now, this is the, this is the state of reality probably forever rather than just a snap in time. But where the app won, all that team, they were overfunded, their budgets were incredible, and they were able to go all the way to the curated layer with all of their data. They were able to manage each of these independently, and now all of a sudden that project is finished and it's beautiful. Unfortunately, app two, they, that team turned over in the middle of the project and who knows what else happened. They were able to get to the silver layer so they get an accomplishment there, not bad. And then we have this other BI attempt that only got us the raw data dumped into a bronze tier, right? How valuable is that? Still very valuable. Remember, one of the hardest things to do is to be able to access data directly out of a line of business system. That's because if you own that system, you realize that every time somebody other than your user base interacts with your data, it's gonna cause your database to slow down one way or another. There's a compromise that has to be made. And so if you have already made this compromise and it's sitting here, nobody asks if it's gonna slow down the data lake because the data lake is already slow. It's not like they're gonna notice. That's just the way it is when you're reading text files. And so now you have your entire lake here that you can run incredible BI analytics if you're willing to do extra query work. Here you can do incredible analysis and you have to do far less and worry about repetition in the work or even getting the business rules wrong. And then you go into the gold layer and it's fantastic and waiting for you, but this is the reality that the data isn't actually there. This might be actionable and ready to go, but it's only this much that's actionable and ready to go. This is where we spend a lot of our time. That's just kind of how it goes. So you're a consultant, you come into one of these companies and they're like, listen, we have, we're using the medallion strategy. Often they start with that and it's very like proud words to use. And then they describe it to you and you're like, oh, you have a little ways to go. That's the nice way to say it. But the reality is it's very difficult to get to the gold curated layer and very few end up getting there. However, we could see this as different portions and maybe it makes sense to have a part of line of business get here, I don't know. It's really hard and it's just a kind of a reality check of the whole thing. So again, the, the idea of duplicating your data, that used to be one of the biggest and hardest parts. You would have an ETL process that you would look at and you'd be like, this is gonna take me a long time. And in order to copy all that over, I'm gonna have this go to here. It's gonna take, not only will it take many minutes because electrons don't flow for nothing and you have to put them somewhere and so we have this beautiful CD-ROM which is not what it's actually stored on but so much is just stored in the lake and you'll find yourself with hmm I don't know it's like it's like my kid's bedroom right you just you walk in and you just can't see I mean just there's more than there needs to be it just seems like and that is what happens really all the way along because once storage is free, it is irresistible to use. And when it's a penny per gigabyte per month, it costs your company nothing. And you're like, just make a second copy. Actually, let's make a third copy. I'll just change the second copy while we'll the third copy is a backup of the first copy. And that sort of language just happens. And now all of a sudden we have tons of data, but it's just the way that it works. All right, so another thing that is at least worth Remembering is your boss is going to show up and say, I would really like a dashboard. And you're like, awesome, good news. I have tons of data from our line of business systems in the bronze layer, we can actually do that. He's like, no, no, I wanna make sure it's curated so we have to go through the regular process. Your dashboard's only gonna be about two thirds of all the business, but I can still do it. And then this is what they always say. It has to be real time. And the problem with real time isn't that you can't do real time. The problem with real time is just getting it into this layer in the first place takes at minimum whatever period that app, that app owner will allow. So is it a nightly dump? Is it an hourly dump? Very unlikely. Is it a end of week, they'll only do it on Saturday when nobody's working dump? More than likely that's what it's going to be. Something along the lines that you have all of these to negotiate just before you get to here. Now the next problem is whatever your ETL process is to get to the silver layer costs you not only the, the time to move the data itself because the idea would be these are very large data sets. 
You want to bring all of them over, and when you do, you want to also transform them and make them so that they're usable. You're not just copying them, making the bronze over here still bronze. You want to make it silver. You want to clean it, remove the duplicates, do all the things to make these, this data actually usable. Silver is the, like, that is truly the prime line, if you ask me. But nonetheless, that introduces more time. Does it introduce another couple of hours? Usually, it, 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 it's, it's a long time. And so, when you are building these out or you're seeing these built and somebody says, okay, it's time for our real-time dashboard so we can look at the analytics and have actionable insights on our data. I mean, that's exactly the marketing language they're, they're hearing. So that's exactly what they're asking you for. And then you're like, impossible. And they're like, impossible? We're gonna need another consultant in here. And so that's the way it goes. And the reality of time is just a difficult thing to swallow. And what's, what's true is, when anybody says real time, we as engineers, we think about it, and we're like, real time? You mean it moves here, and it, so you see it move here. Like the stock market, that's real time. That's never what people really mean. Because what they really mean is the word they don't know. They don't know near time, right? As close to real time as I can get without spending an extra million dollars. That's usually what they mean. But they don't know how to say it, so they say real time. And what they really just mean is as fast, as fast as possible. But what we hear is what's impossible. And so we get to this kind of inflexible crossing point where that's very difficult only because we have this language problem. Just kind of the way it goes. All right, I do want to just point out um, that this is not ETL. Almost all the time it's not ETL because ETL is so expensive, right? So first, when you're coming from the app into the bronze layer, this is just EL, there's no T. It's extract and load, it's just a dump truck, right? Beautiful. Then we also have ETL, which would ETL would probably be here. So ELT is extract, load, and then do some tinkering on the other side once it's there. And the reason you have the T at the end is because really you have, you're waiting for other systems to arrive before you can do the work. It's really nice to think about doing it in flight so when the data lands, it's already ready to go. But the truth is that's not the way things end up. What happens is we have to wait for all the other applications to land so we can finally make those surrogate keys work or whatever it is we need to to make them connect. Okay, so that's just the idea of ETL and ELT and how important that is. Let this be the takeaway, if nothing else from today, that um, Microsoft has a tool called Azure Data Factory. This is not a recommendation to use Azure Data Factory, not at all, but I wanna explain what it does. It is an ETL management tool that allows you to figure out what the source is, what the target is, then where the tables and kind of map some of the columns and things like that. It does all of the orchestration that you would need to complete one of the transitions from one state to another. Great. Whatever tool you use, great. Honestly, I mean that with all my heart. Here's what I don't want you to do. Don't write your own tool. It is so tempting to write a whole bunch of Jupyter notebooks and execute them on a timer job inside Databricks to move all of your data from one location to another because all you need to do is write some really nice Python and have it all clean and ready to go. And that feels like you've done it, except for now suddenly you're missing something. What about observability? Is this full thing, is this logged? Is this gonna be, log well, I'll add logging, no problem. And it is very easy to go in, import logging into your Python notebooks and add some logging. Terrific, all right, this is audited as well. Okay, so here's what I'm gonna do to make it audited. And so you go in and you build another construct. Now, I'm gonna need a, pay a single pane of glass to be able to see all of this. Okay, so we're gonna build a dashboarding service on top of our notebooks to make sure that you can see what each one is doing. And it never ends. And you ended up, instead of spending all of your nice time orchestrating the data from one place to another, you built this subsystem that already exists and costs like $40 a month. I mean, it makes no sense what you have done, but it's so tempting that we as engineers, we see it, we see the gap, we build a little, then we build a little more, then we build a little more, and then we get promoted and we leave and the next guy comes in who happens to be an ax murderer. And so he comes in and he looks at your work and he's like, what have you done? And he also knows where your house is. And so this is really, for all of us, just a safety thing to keep in mind that you need to make choices that the maintenance developer, who really is the person we screw the most, is the one that loves us because they're like, thank you for making these choices. This is maintainable. This is not something that I have to maintain, manage in-house. I don't need an entire development team just to handle your special ETL process. I just follow a normal standard procedure. So please use Azure Data Factory or whatever the equivalent to Azure Data Factory is out there. I will say ADF is pretty nice. This is, I mean, I mean, it's not my tool, but I'm still pretty nice. So quick summary. 
What's the quality of each one? It's raw in bronze, not so great, but not terrible, right? Nice and clean in silver, pretty great too. Curated in gold, couldn't be better, could not be better. Is it enriched? No. Is it enriched? Perhaps. You know, is it enriched? Yeah, more than likely it is. That's the reason you're calling it the curated section. Enriched would be bringing in third-party data or outside data that's not necessarily part of your line of business systems. And then is it reliable? Maybe. Maybe. Because there's special logic inside the line of business systems that rely on certain bugs in that system. And they don't show up in the reports because they have been written around those bugs. However, you don't see that necessarily in just a raw dump of the data. So now you're querying that data without knowledge of the bug. Nicely, in the silver, we brought that knowledge over from your line of business system into the ETL process, and now suddenly we have reliable data. Is it super duper? No. Is this super duper? For sure. Very reliable. And then we have what the delay is, and it's just short, medium, and long. I mean, what does that even mean in time? You can't measure it, but just know it's a lot. And so by the time you get the data that you really love and you really like and you really can use, it is not last hour's data anymore, right? It's, it's, there's a lot of time that has passed, a lot of negotiating with a lot of teams in a company in order to get your data to this point. So just something to know. All right, little bonus. Uh, I use Jupyter Notebooks, obviously. I write Python, I love it, I understand the value. But if you don't know, there's a thing called Polyglot SQL Notebooks if you like to write in SQL and interact with SQL just like you would a Jupyter Notebook goes to Databricks or something along those lines. The Polyglot does the same thing. Also, it, uh, it also you could also write C Sharp in it. It's spectacular. It's great. I'm also a professor of computer science uh, at home. I'm from Colorado. I guess I forgot to say that, but I'm from Colorado. And um, we use notebooks all the time because uh, C Sharp is an important part of computer science. And so... At least I like to think so. Terrific, little bonus at the end of chapter one. Here's chapter two and just managing you as an engineer. So now we'll get down to a little lower level where we actually participate. The other was just a politics game. You could kind of see all the things that happened there. But now it's, we're just thinking about how do we develop our database. Maybe we're developing the next line of business system. Maybe we're developing a special third database that manages others. Who knows what it is, but let's just say we're about to build a database and we are the team. Pretty large team, but let's just say we have sub-teams. Now, here's the issue. Let's, let's let SQL Server be the database, since SQL Server is my database. And you come in and you make a change to the database. I come in, I make a change to the database, and after, by the end of the week, it's really in good shape. Like, we have made the changes that need to be made. However, what were those changes that were made? Well, I wrote them down in a nice Word document. You wrote them also down in a Word document. And we have seven Word documents at the end of the week that if we just compare, we can see all the changes that were made. Now a month passes and we have four weeks, that, four different week sections that have happened. Each one is being very well documented, but it's equally painful because it's hard to know all the changes. And here's the problem, but you and I, we look at a database a little bit like a folder structure. It's a little bit like it's just where you throw your data, especially like if you think of like new in career developers, what's a database? It's a place where you store data. Is that wrong? It is not wrong, it is totally not wrong. However, it's also not right. There's so much more to a database to that, and it's very difficult to have all of those details codified in a place that we as a team can recreate the same database on all of our local environments. It's very difficult. So instead, this is what we want. This is the problem, right? It's very difficult, all those things. And this is what we want. We want to have a declarative approach where we say, I want it to be like this, and then have that declaration be applied to a database for us. That's what I want. I want to declare it here and then have a system do the work that touches the database for me because I can read that declaration as if it's the Word document that says what I want to do. It also means that you can declare it as well and that we can have a merge conflict in source control until we get it right and we can all agree. And so we don't have these weird, very difficult documentation scenarios. I want to make sure that I can look at the schema that you just did while I was on vacation and I can see the differences between my local environment and the new environment. I want to be able to see what's happened in the uh, production environment versus when we had the hot fix last month so I can see just those small little deltas and I can be able to address those as well. That sort of differencing system is very important. 
And then finally, I wanna be able to work offline and I wanna make sure that this all fits into my normal workflow, my normal process, my CI CD pipeline that I would automate anyway. I don't want something new. I want this to fit into my normal teamwork. That's important. This is not something that is common, by the way. When you have a database, more likely, more than likely, um, you just can't say always, but almost more than likely, almost lots more than likely, not quite always, that's what I mean to say, not quite always, teams just work with the database directly. And the idea of having a declarative and source controlled schema is, un is very, very unlikely, unless it is changed, extracted, put into a file, and added to source control. Then they change the database again, extract it, put it into a file, and have it in source control. And what's nice is you're at a review meeting with your manager, and they say, uh, are you using source control for your schema? You can be like, every day. Absolutely we are. But you're really not, because it's not declarative going into the database. You're just taking a snapshot every time, requiring some reverse engineering if you ever needed to go back in time. All right. So... This is solved, by the way, with a SQL project. And so I'll talk, this is, it's beautiful. Gosh, it's beautiful. And the fact that it's so uncommon in uh, team scenarios blows my mind. So in Visual Studio, which is what I prefer to use, in Visual Studio, you can add this as an extension. There's no cost to this, it's just a template. It's an incredible tool. And it basically you go and install the, uh, let's see, this is actually Visual Studio Code, so it's also in Visual Studio Code. I use Visual Studio, here we go. Here's the Visual Studio side. All you have to do is go into the workflow workloads and make sure that you've added the SQL data tools. And so if you've added the SQL Server data tools, SSDT, you'll often see it in documentation written that way, then all of a sudden you have it. And it gives you a brand new project type called database, and it's spectacular. It's spectacular. All right, so some of the things that you can do after you create it, so this is a SQL Server database project, and it's specific to SQL Server, right? That's important. Um, and you can figure out what the target is. Now, this is a really big idea because it allows you as a team to focus on the 2019 version of SQL Server that's in production while still being able to build to the 2022 version in the same source file. So it allows you to retarget and be able to see what the differences are. So imagine this, you have a database and you have a whole bunch of store procedures and views and things, and you've been clever and all the tooling and things that you've used inside it and all the functions that you've invoked. And then you want to change it back to one of your customers has asked that, that they, don't, they don't have a license for 2022, so they have to do it in 2019. And so you're like, okay, so I'm in 2022, let's back this down to 2019. Now tell me everything that doesn't work without breaking anything, right? Because this works like a build system for your code. Every time I say control shift G, no, control shift B, it builds my code as well as my database, validating everything. Every column use, every name, every view calling back to the tables, nothing is wrong. Then I can go in and say all of the features of the database are individually set here. And so I can, I can change collation, I can change everything that you can change inside a database, you can change here as well. So that means I can take a completely vanilla database, brand new, just installed, and I can apply this to it and it becomes the perfect database for me. Right? Exactly modeled whatever I have in source control. Right? And so including my ability to compare two different versions because even though you fixed the bug, I need to apply this now into production. So I look at your fixes and I can see all the subtle changes you've made in the database. I can see what those differences are so I can write the update script. And by the way, the tool writes the update script. I just need to review it and make sure what it's about to do makes sense and I approve it. Right? That's the important step. All right. So. Let me show you just uh, at kind of a high level what this would look like for you. So this is, a, um, this is a typical solution. There's an error right now, and the reason there's an error is just simply because um, it's not complete. And I, I know that it's not complete. I'm about to show you. And uh, let me zoom in just a little so it's slightly bigger. And so it's a normal solution. I have a, my, my app-db is what I called it. It's just a database solution. And you can see it has procedures and scripts and tables and views. These are, these are folders I created because I like to lay it out like this. You might lay it out in a different way. Maybe it's by schema or something along those lines, or you like to make it look just like SQL Server Management Studio, whatever you like. That's totally cool. And, uh, but I like it like this. And so I go in and I see that I have, well, here's a great, 
piece. This error tells me that there's a view referencing a table that doesn't exist. I know that's an error because my tables folder is empty and I also know that I deleted it just before my talk so I could show you. And it's that sort of piece is where you can put it in your CI CD pipeline and say, here's my database, add it to my source code, and your CI CD pipeline can be a gate that say your, data, your database is invalid. I won't even allow you to check it in. Now that is really awesome, right? Where you can reject somebody's PR automatically simply because the database is invalid and you don't have to look over any of their SQL scripts. That's not saying their SQL is smart, I'm just saying it, it, it can't be invalid, right? That's a big first step, just like C-sharp can't be invalid in order for it to build either. So it's really great. Let's, let's add one here so you can see what it looks like. So I'll say right-click, add, oh, can't quite see it. There we go, good. I'll add a new table. Now this is just a file. There's nothing special, it's just a file. And so it'll create a new file, it'll ask me the name, and I have to zoom out so I can see it too. I'll call it users, like so. And this is the contents of the file, and then this is the designer you just sort of get for free because you have this type of a project. So you can see it's just create table users with the ID primary key, nothing special. And then up here, you can see it's a designer. Though if I don't like SQL, I could just go up here and do it. It's whatever I want. It's just like nice features. We as engineers always like the code. The designer is sort of, you know, it's for, it's for children, you know. But nonetheless, it's really nice sometimes. Okay, so uh, watch this. I'll go in and I'll say this is going to be an uh, identity. And then I'll add name as a varchar, let's say 255. All right, and not null. Great. And let's add administrator, administrator, as a bit, not null, perfect. Actually, let's not say it's not null, let's default it to zero. Okay, great, all right. What's nice is, as I make changes here, obviously those changes are gonna be reflected up there, but more importantly, you can see that the views no longer has a red line under it because there's no longer an error. I've created the table it was looking for. Very simple, of course, but I just want you to see that one of the powers here is to be able to go in and see what, what changes have I made that are wrong. Here's another example. How many store procedures and how many views are referencing this table? Anybody know? I can easily go in and I can ask for all references, just like I do in C Sharp. But watch this, I can also do semantic renaming. So I can go in, for example, to name right here, right click, say refactor rename. So renaming is not the same as, as semantic renaming, right? So semantic renaming relies on the compiler to do the work for you. Regular renaming is a file find and search sort of thing, right? Where it's just finding and replacing in multiple files. It's not reliable, that's why we use semantic renaming because it might be referenced by some other, some other name or some other case other places. So, for example, I'm gonna change name here to let's say full name and say okay, and when it does, it pulls up the view, any store procedure, any trigger, any absolutely everything you can imagine inside this database that references that column and, and changes all of them for me at once. This level of refactoring makes it so that being able to, if you're working directly against the database and you go into a stored procedure or table and make a significant change, the only way to find this sort of error is to run every object and wait for it. You don't get an error from SQL or any other database that has semantic connections to all the other types. So you have to like go through the pain of running all of your unit tests just to be able to figure out if you broke anything in the first place. This solves all of that loop to make it nice and tight so you can make everything together. And I can say, once I've made this change to the full name, I can then do a schema compare against my uh, developer database and I can come up with the update script that all developers on my team can run. They can all look and they can see the, up, the updated, all the fields, whatever they are and it only changes what needs to be changed, right? It's, it's, it's really beautiful, and it solves a critically painful problem that teams go through over and over again. I, I will just point out one other thing before I uh, jump out of this. Oop, not that, though, this. Um, so I can, I can have, there's nothing in a database that you can have that you can't put in this. That's important. And everything is a create statement, right? It's all declared, like what do I want? I want, a, I want a table, I'm not altering the table, I'm not dropping the table, I'm only creating because I am using this as the declaration of what it is I want to make. And so it builds its own database schema package that it compares against the real database and it's called the DAC pack, D-A-C-P-A-C. I don't understand why it's named that, but I know that it is. Data, application, T, 
tier. Uh, it's, it's, I don't know where the tier went, went but it, they use the word tier all the time. That part doesn't matter. It's a DAC pack file, and it has all of your schema. And what's nice is I can take a DAC pack, and it's the result of when I build, right? It's just regular MS build, nothing special. And when it executes, it produces a DAC pack that I could give to anybody, including SQL Server itself, and it knows how to apply it. Right? That's really, really nice. But I also have the idea of scripts. And so you might have, for example, in a developer environment, you would have an empty database, but you would want some sample data. And so I can have scripts that run ahead of time or after time, they're pre and post, to, to insert data after I've created the structures where they may go. Or I may want to set up um, authentication first. So I may have a pre-script that sets up authentication, injects all of my objects, and then a postscript that inserts a whole bunch of sample data because it's intended for the developer's desktop while they're working to make sure that their experience is identical all the way around, no matter where you are, no matter who you are, all of your environments are the same. Okay, let me, uh, let me back out here. Well, I gotta show you this too. All right, so, this wasn't, I didn't wanna show you, I do wanna show you, obviously I wanna show you this. So, this XML file is the publish XML file that points to your database and keeps all of your credentials secret, but it allows you to specify all the extra pieces that you want to, that you, all the extra rules that you want to obey as you're applying it. So for example, one of the things you might do is you might set that you wanna block incremental, you wanna block all deployments that might lose data. That's what it's saying, right? So if there's a possibility that you're going from varchar 100 to varchar 50, then you could lose the last 50 of that field so that it'll automatically be blocked. If you go the other way from 50 to 100, that won't happen, everything's cool. So that's nice, and you can go on and on down. You can say whether or not to recreate the database from scratch every time, and everything else you could possibly imagine. Skip different things, include different things, and it gives you the sort of flexibility that makes it every time I right-click that project and I say publish, it points to my SQL Server, usually on my device or some close place on the network, and just immediately creates the perfect, pristine database every single time. Now. Imagine this scenario, you're about to run unit tests, unit tests against your database, and you need the database to be reliable. Who knows what the last developer was doing with your shared SQL server, I don't know if my tests are gonna work. That's not the way it goes. Right before I run my unit tests, I deploy my database and have the perfect database exactly the way I need it to be. Probably completely empty, and then when it runs, the unit tests are responsible for injecting the sample data they would use to be able to test themselves. It's really, really cool stuff. Okay. Let me, uh, let me keep going here, <laughs> great. SQL Proj is not the only thing that can do this. There are other tools just like it. Um, Liquibase, very popular. Liquibase is nice if, you, if you're not a SQL Server user. Has similar integrations into Visual Studio, not exactly the same, but similar for sure. There's also Flyway and DBUp. Those are all valid, for sure valid. Uh, the Microsoft one is, if you're a SQL Server user, it makes no sense to, in my mind not to use. Uh, SQL Proj, but all the rest are great too. The important part is this is an important like characteristic of data engineering on a team. That is what's important, that we're not working directly against a database, but instead we're working um, in a source control environment. Okay, another cool little bonus at the end of this chapter. If you've not come across WinGit, this is the chocolatey for Windows. Already installed, everybody who has Windows already has this. And uh, it's the easiest, quickest way to install basically everything you can imagine. So if you can, if you can spell it, you could probably install it this way. So in this case, it's Wingit install SSMS, SQL Server Management Studio. Um, you could just as easily say SQL Server install uh, SQL 2019. You could, you could say Visual Studio. I mean, it's insane what you can install. And so if you haven't come across Wingit, it certainly makes installing, especially Microsoft tools, very easy. I mean, you need to have SQL Server installed. So needless to say, you would go to the internet, you would Google download SQL Server, you would go find the download link, you would find the one that you want. All of that is just basically taken away. And it's also made it so that you can create a script file to install everything you need whenever you repave a brand new machine. So it's really nice. If you haven't found Winget, does anybody use Winget? Okay, all 
both of you. Okay, great. All right, so that's good. And do I. I. I do too. I do too. All right, so let's talk about pipelines. Once we get this into a CI CD pipeline, this is really where it pays off the most. So we already had this incredible experience by putting everything into source control, but now we have a CI CD pipeline that we'll be able to use. So I've built my DAC pack as a developer, and uh, this is just representing the DAC pack itself. But just imagine all of those files, those SQL files, not the, not the final build file, but everything that I'm putting into source control. And I would create a PR naturally, and then that PR would go into my CI part of my CI CD, right? And what it's going to do is evaluate my PR and see if all the gates pass so it can go into master. That's a reasonable thing to do. So I, it goes into my PR, the CI, the CI has to pass first, it's reviewed by whoever the code owners are, hopefully it goes through a rigorous uh, set of tests as well, and then, because the CI includes all of that sort of thing, and then it goes into master, and then it's not, of course, pushed into any environment that users can see, but I would have my CD push those on. This is just as, about as simple, as high level as we can go with CI CD pipelines. And it's brilliant. All right, so let's think about each of the individual parts when we are talking about um, deploying the database itself. Okay, so the, um, the first step that you would never skip is linting. So again, these are just the workflows of a data engineering team, right? The very first thing is to make it so that the fact that I like to do everything as lowercase and you like to do everything as uppercase means that we will have to negotiate with a final solution and then we will apply that to the rules of our linting system and they will ensure that regardless of anybody on our team, we're all doing it the same way. So what's even nicer is you can have linting tools refactor your code for you as well or rely on the developer to simply match those rules, it's kind of up to you. Sort of like how a C-sharp analyzer works, right? Where it finds the error, gives you the option to fix it, or you could fix it. And then we go through the build process, script it, we'll go through each of these individually. So let me go ahead and begin. And, um, but start by saying, this seems a little bit complicated. I agree, it seems a smidgen complicated, but it's very important. And I just wanna, this isn't bragging, it's just making the point that this is the result of where I've seen it. So. The largest brewery in the world does it exactly like this. That is, I can guarantee you. Man, I know they, they do now. Uh, the second, the largest insurance company in England does it this way, second in the world. Uh, the largest uh, airline in America, they do it this way. Right? It's, now remember from the beginning where it is, we don't, we're not trying to copy them. We're just trying to steal all of their good ideas. They have the endless wealth to be able to figure all this out. We just take all of their best things. Right? Uh, the largest uh, law enforcement agency in America does it this way. They have a lot of data on you probably. Uh, the two largest grocery stores in America, they also do it this way. And there's a software company that does it this way. Um, so it's also very big, very, very big with unexplainable st stock price right now. And so I say all that to say, this isn't just like arbitrary. It's actually a pretty great set of like proven use cases that are out there. And even though I can't walk you through each of these companies, I've definitely abstracted out the, uh, or extracted out all of the important parts that make sense that are repeatable again and again and again. So let's start with linting. T-SQL lint is the, um, uh, this is the GitHub repo that has what has to be the best of all the linting options out there. It runs both on your machine as well as, as, as the command line inside your pipeline. It's easy to use. You can make it as a sub-module inside your normal repo if you want. There's all kinds of options, but it's very straightforward to use. If you don't already have some sort of SQL linting, then your SQL starts to get goopy pretty quick. And remember, the guy who comes after you is Axe Murder. And so you wanna be as careful as possible with the nonsense that you leave behind. Okay, so that's just linting, we'll just leave that behind. It obviously needs to be the first gate because we want all of our code to look nice, right? I mean, we're engineers, we're paid to write code, we're paid to write good code, and that's the way it goes. All right, so then along comes build. That, uh, well, in this world, just talking about DAC packs for a moment, all you need is regular MS build. So the upside to that is all you need is regular MS build. It's the same thing that you would use to do any of your solutions. The downside, depending on how you look at things, is the container that you would use to execute MS build needs to be a Windows device. Is that a big deal? It's inv invisible to you, so why would you care? So um, it loads the same speed, it runs the same thing, it just has to be a Windows device. All right, so then we get to 
building out the script that shows what the incremental change is going to be. And so now we have SQL Publish. SQL Publish is the companion, the brother, the, the sibling to um, the SQL project that basically can take a SQL project and push it anywhere, including push, getting ready to push it, stop, and just produce the script that was going to run. So you can do either one. You can actually do the up, incremental upgrade, or you can do the script itself. And so that's what SQL Publish gives you. Brilliant again, so handy. Of course, this is what you wanna do because you wanna be able to review this script rather than just apply it to wherever it's going to go. But we'll start with the, with the, the script, then we'll go into deploying it. And I'll make one point that I'm surprised is not universally well known, and that is that um, SQL runs on Linux and it runs in a container. And so this is the MCR container used for um, SQL Server. Every version of SQL all run like this, so you can do all of these in a tiny little container that you can run all of your tests against, and it's no big deal. So what you can do is you can first deploy your production development, your production schema into this container, and then you can deploy your development schema on top of that to make sure that you never get to a point that you can't upgrade to it. Right? You're never creating a scenario where it's some sort of, um, some sort of loop or some sort of deadlock. So again, this is the MCR container for Microsoft, Microsoft MCR, Microsoft Container Service, I think. No, registry, Microsoft Container, container Registry. But it, it's all pointed from, uh, from Docker here. All right, so nothing special with that, but it's very important to know that what are we deploying to in our CI CD pipeline is not some development database that's waiting for our CI CD pipeline to be for its use. Not at all. The, those can exist, but they shouldn't, right? This should be an ephemeral container that pops up and goes away right away after it proves whatever it is that needs to happen. All right, so then we go through the update service. We would use SQL Publish again. Instead of creating the script, now we're actually executing it. We wanna have the script for later is the reason we created it before. And so now I've run the script against the database and basically upgraded it from being a, a deployed production version. And then I run a series of unit tests, and I wanna bring this up first, but I don't wanna stay here. So I wanna say T SQL T is a testing framework built for testing SQL Server, right? T SQL T. And uh, T SQL means transact SQL, T for test, there you go. And it's free, you can incorporate it, people incorporate this all the time. It's a wonderful framework, I'll start with saying that. All right, so after we've gone through automated testing, then we go to the human process where you decide whether or not the script that you're reviewing from the third step over here has everything okay. You're like, well, wait a minute, wasn't it deployed and updated and tested successfully with all green lights? That doesn't mean that your database is really ready. There are still people involved. So until AI takes over the world, we need to review these sorts of things to make sure that something crazy isn't happening and just skipping through some of the edge cases that we may not be testing for. And then finally, you get to the update. And then the update, I don't know how that's going to run. Is a SQL publish again because it's automated or do you hand this off to an administrator because they say only our team can execute scripts against production database? That happens a lot. So it's up to you on how the final update happens. This is a pretty normal process to go through, by the way. And so if your process looks something like this, then great job because this is both sensible and manageable. It's not overly complex, although it is very sophisticated at the same time. Okay, little bonus for this chapter is if you haven't discovered, there's a new SQL CMD. SQL CMD is the CLI or the command line for SQL, rewritten in Go, cross-platform, freaking amazing. Interacts with Docker now so that you can spin up containers on the fly, so you can use it inside your CI CD pipeline basically to create all of these in a single line. It's really nice. So if you haven't already found Go SQL CMD, it's worth finding. All right, now to testing. Let me uh, start by saying that, let me show you this real quick. All right, so I have two, let me see if I can zoom in one more time. I have two database projects. I have the first primary database. So this is everything that makes up your line of business system and all the tables and scripts and, and the end. And it's great, this is, this is the way it should be. And I'll just show also that there's a store procedure that's called upgrade user, just as there's a view that's called administrators, because remember the only thing special in that table was almost empty, was that it had an administrator bit, and so it'd be very easy for me then to write a view that's called administrators that only waits if there's, you know, administrator equals one, and then upgrade user, you pass in the user ID and we change their, num their bit from zero to one. Right, so very simple. If you were to look at the code of that, you'd be like, this is kind of boring. I meant to make it boring because I want to show you this. 
There are two database projects. They both have this cute little icon, you know, box with a, with a database. And the second one is a list of tests that are in it. And so, testing your database, and this is interesting. You can be honest with me. How many people test their database objects? Well, it's fewer than before, and that was only two. What's that? Well, it depends on what the test is. Oh, integration test. No, it doesn't. Okay. So, no, it has to be automated to count, right? And I think automated tests because we write a method in C Sharp, and we test to see whether that method can be called with good data, bad data, large ranges of data, whether or not it throws an exception in certain instances, whether or not it even responds depending on different conditions. And then we write a method in our SQL Server that is just as important, if not more important, and we just, we just know it works, and we just leave it alone, right? It's just amazing if you think about it. And the problem isn't us. This is like driving on the street. The problem isn't us. We don't wear our seatbelt because we're bad drivers. We wear our seatbelts because everybody else is a terrible driver, right? We have unit tests, not because we're not good at coding. We're very good. We're excellent engineers. This whole room, this is the cream of the crop. But outside of this room, I'm telling you, we need unit tests for those people because that is a serious problem. They are not thinking like we're thinking. They are not dedicated to excellence like we are dedicated to excellence. They are not even paying attention half the time. And so they come in and they will change your C-sharp method and you will catch it with a unit test because you have written enough unit tests to be able to track that. And then they will go over to SQL and they will change your SQL statement and nobody will even know, right? It's terrifying, just terrifying. Ah because we don't write unit tests for them. Okay, so an example of what, so let's start with, one of the hardest things to deal with inside SQL is that there's no assert, there's no framework to actually do unit tests. So, these are the assert methods. So this is assert contains, there's assert equals, assert everything you can imagine, right? Everything that basically matches how you would do it in a regular OOP environment, now you can do it in T-SQL because there's an entire assert framework now that all you need to do is run this and you immediately have all of these stored procedures waiting for you. Well, don't take a picture of this. Take it a picture in a minute when I show you where to get it. And, and then listen, you could have written this. I mean, honestly, I mean, you might look at it right now, you're like, I don't know, you, trust me. You could have written, I mean, us? I mean, we could do it. But the thing is, I did for you. Now you can take it from here and you can make it even better and make it fit whatever your, your, your company needs. And it's terrific. And so we have the assert framework right here so you can do everything at the end of your methods. So it would look like this. I'll have a store procedure named like a, like a unit test. Upgrade user with an invalid user, not upgraded. Okay, great, all right, I see that. And so the important part is every unit test starts a transaction and begins to just monkey with the data all at once because on the other end, I can roll that back and everything is gone. It's a perfect environment for testing because I can literally set it to be everything I need it to be perfectly for the unit test. So I could go in here and I can truncate the table, insert the users that I need, go down and try to upgrade a user that doesn't exist, which is, this is user negative one, right? And then I could start checking things. I can look to see how many administrators are there, and I can say assert.equal, and I have my expected and my actual values. Then I can say, well, how many, how many, wait, that's not administrators. How many administrators are there? And I should have the same number, or the you know, same expected number. And I could keep on going from there. I could select from a table and count its rows. I could look to see whether or not fragments of strings are in other strings, all the things you would expect in an assert statement. I can go on and on and on until I need it. Right, that's all. That, like, just do what you need, but all, all of it is sitting there waiting for you to use if you need it. Then, how do I execute these? Well, this is what I want. This is the whole reason we're in this screen. I want you to see this references dialog. Let's see if I can zoom in for you. Okay, so this references dialog is a lot like referring to a class library in C or C Sharp, except for this is referring to a database. Well, when I refer to a class library in an, in an in a language, I get all of those classes and types as if they were part of my application. That's the exact same way it works when I have a database referenced into another database. And these projects just give you this capability. So now, I have all of the database from my line of business application, every table, every view, every store procedure, except for I also have the assert framework in place, all the schema that has all of that, 
and whatever store procedures that represent unit tests are for me. And they all start with, let's see if I can, there we go. And they all, let, uh, just let me scroll to the top there, there you go. And they all start with tests, and that'll be important because somehow I need to identify which store procedures are intended to be unit tests and which ones aren't. So done. I've been able to separate all the logic so that they don't convolute each other. I can have one in a tests database, and I can have another in a not tests database. And when I run or try to build the test database, it includes all of the others as well. So I'm able to test the exact same one, regular, like it's, they're just linked files, they aren't copies. So you're always testing the database as it actually is in source control. Right? Pretty neat stuff. And okay, now let me show you this one other thing. This is a this is a test runner. This is an X unit um, class uh, project. X unit pro I call it test runner because it need you need to have a unit test to run so that you can integrate it into your CI CD. Now earlier I said you could use T SQL T. This does the same thing, but not everybody's comfortable with invisible. Like a lot of people will look at a black box and be, I'm glad it does what it does, but I wish I owned it so I could do it. Well, how much would it cost you to be able to write your own black box? Well, this is the unit test that you must have. And let me, there you go. This is the unit test that you must have in order to um, run all of your stored procedures. Right? So you will have to have a theory. The theory runs more than once because it's data driven, right? The other was a fact, so you only get a single value. So then you set up what the data is. And then in this case, the data is, returns a type of theory data. It's just part of the X unit framework. It's nothing special. And it returns just a string list of all of the store procedure names for it to run. Nothing else, right? So I have a store, I have a query written that says, give me all the procedures that have test or are in the test schema. That's it. And so this returns that back here and it executes it the end because if it fails, because the assert uh, schema th throws an exception for one reason or another, I want that unit test to also fail like I would in a normal environment. And if it doesn't fail, if it just runs all the way through, then that's a pass just like it would in a normal environment. So I could have five million store procedures executing as a result of this one line method that I have that would really be the test runner for my entire database. Then I could say to my you know, junior DBA, get in there and write those tests and go to town and they can go to town. And it never really matters because, I mean, and it, of course it matters, but it, you're never gonna overwhelm anything because unit tests are meant to scale. So you can have thousands and thousands and thousands. Um, and earlier when I said five million, I don't actually know how that would perform, but thousands and thousands and thousands of unit tests is pretty common. Well, I think .NET has three or 400,000. So you can go to half a million, right, how about that? You, I tell you what, you guys get to half a million, then we'll talk about millions and millions after that. All right, if you have that many unit tests, you should be uh, talking next year for sure. Okay, uh, I just did, brilliant. Okay, here's where you get it, here it is. AKMS slash SQL slash assert. This will be everything you need, including the documentation to be able to use it. And it is fantastic, by the way. It's, it works exactly the way you want it to work. And a, a lot of great ideas from around the internet have been coalesced into one final piece. And so it's very nice. Yeah, I mean, it, and if you're a C Sharp or Java developer or JavaScript developer, and you're accustomed to a search, then you'll be accustomed to how this works and the language behind it as well, <laughs> for sure. Okay. Uh, here we go. This is the uh, this is that method, straightforward method for sure. Um, uh, and here's if you want it, I, I I thought there might be a possibility that you guys wanted to steal that as well. So if you do, that's a tiny URL. The other one is official Microsoft stuff. So tiny URL slash Jerry dash NDC dash DB test. Right. So it's it's not just that. It's the piece above it just to interact with SQL Server. Nothing special. There's no exotic code. It's just special. It's just structured. All right, I want you to at least hear this. Whenever your application interacts with the database, use a middle layer to do that, right? That's your data API. However, let me also say that the best advice I can give you is not to write that middle layer because it is just CRUD code that you have written over and over again. And you might think to yourself, I know how to write CodeSmith, I know how to write uh, all these generators, don't worry. I'll point it to my POCO objects and it'll be like magic and we'll have all of these things. Jerry, don't, don't fret. Great, I think that's totally okay. Except 
Those now need unit tests and those now need documentation and all of the other pieces. It makes way more sense to have an API layer that is built for you by an engine. And so the data API builder, DAB, is um, that tool takes in a description of your database as JSON and you don't get to code it, right? You give it to a container as the entry point and then it opens up the GraphQL endpoints and the REST endpoints for you with the same type of security that you would have built, the same type of GraphQL resolvers that you would have built, the same sort of uh, observability and telemetry that you would have built. All of those things have already been done and now you have it and it's done by the end of the afternoon and you look like a hero. It makes so much more sense to have an API engine that is built or con configured for you than anything else that it doesn't make sense to do it any other way. Like, I would like to have a conversation with anybody who's like, I would rather hand code all of this by heart. And if you said, I'm paid by the hour, then I would understand. Otherwise, it makes no sense, right? And so, I don't want to take any food off of your plate for sure. Okay, does this matter? It does matter, and I'll tell you why it matters. Um, for a beverage company in America, we were able to change their sales. So we were able to get to them to a silver layer and be able to do some analytics on it. And we quantitatively changed their sales by 0.8%, $440 million. So it was beautiful. So it doesn't matter, it totally matters because you have all this latent knowledge and latent data that you're not really able to use today. So, uh, a small amount of attention goes a long way. That's all there is to it. Just a small amount of attention uh, goes a long way. Okay, chapter five is gonna be a mystery. I mean, I'm gonna respect the time. I can see what time it is. And so we will have to just wonder what chapter five was going to be. I'll just go really quick and I apologize for doing it this way, but I mean, it, th these things are worth time. All right, so let's say that there was a change about to be made in your database and it's very significant. They wanna change it so that the full name column is now broken apart into first name and last name. That seems so easy and so nice. So all you have to do is just have two and then change your application to write to those two instead of writing to the one. But that you would never do that because we as a team know that's how you break and have nightmares. So instead what you would do is you would do the normal piece of adding the first and last name, but you would not remove the full name. And you also wouldn't change your application. You would instead change your database. So the database now has, full, has regular full name, so just pretend that says full name, and then you have first name and last name, and to make those work, you don't change your application again. Remember, this is temporary. This is just what you're doing in the interim because patience is the key to success. And so we would have, we would start with our application turning off the ability to write to first and last name, right? So I go to my dev team, that's this side of the room. And I'm like, guys, we've gotta be able to write to first name and last name. Um, go ahead and write the application. Then I would go to this team and I would say, okay, well, we wanna turn all the stuff they're about to do off, right? So they we would not talk to you about it. And we would do it all through feature management. It's built in, it's easy to do. It's just a yes, no flag on whether or not you write to one field or the other. So we make it so our application is ready but not doing it, right? So we're testing it like crazy back in the dev room, but we're not doing anything in production. But instead, in production, we have introduced a trigger that automatically splits first name and last name for us and writes it into first name and last name. Now, this is not a great solution, but it's at least a temporary one. And then eventually, when we have proven that everything works and everything is fine in the database, all of our reports and all of our all of our bronze layers and silver layers and gold layers still work even with these extra fields and they're able to read it. Then all of a sudden I'm able to say, okay, let's flip that flag. Let's start using the new one because everything still works with it. And now we, our patience has made it so that we don't have to roll anything back. We don't have to go into any sort of nightmare scenario. Instead, we've done a little bit here. I've held back the app, a little bit more checking, held back the app, and then we released the app, which was already tested because they were all written at the same time. That's really, really nice. Uh, one thing I do want to point out is Jerry Nixon, which is my name, is easy to split the first name and last name. Uh, my daughter is in college. She has a roommate named Hannah Rose. She goes by her middle name, Hannah Rose. And so she would be Hannah Rose Nixon if we were just looking at her name. And that would be a frustration point for us when we're splitting by string. There's no doubt it. My oldest daughter's name is Anna Laura, Anna Laura. So she would go Anna Laura Rose Nixon which is really frustrating when you think about having to split a name by space. And then my wife's maiden name is, is Van Eaton. So it'd be Anna Laura Rose Van Eaton. Now I'm gonna give you 
the engineering task of please separate first name from last name so that we can have all of our letterheads say Mr. and Mrs. Smith, right, or whatever it is. And you're like, no problem. And of course, you know, your initial algorithm is split by space, take first, take last, no problem. And then all of a sudden, Anna Laura Rose Nixon walks into the room and you're like, is there any other developer who can take this task because I, I'm not feeling well today? And it's the way it goes. And it's crazy how such, a, such simple things become such real nightmares so quickly. And your manager's like, how long is this gonna take? Well, you mean to split the name? It should be pretty quick, yeah, yeah, let me think about it. Oh, it could take a while, actually it might, I don't know if we can even do it. And that is the kind of weird conversation they're hearing from you and they're trying to make decisions on budgeting and timing and talk to their boss and all the other things. It's a terrible nightmare all the way around. Thanks for uh, listening to that part. That's everything. It does still matter. And uh, if there are any questions, we can still take them right now. I'll stay until everybody's gone. Thank you. Thank you.